Thank you, Lane, and thank you, everybody, for coming today. I appreciate you joining in our presentation today on geothermal diagnostics. Geothermal diagnostics is one of the easiest things out there to do. It's, uh, it doesn't require any special instrumentation, a lot of knowledge, a couple of simple tools, and you can figure out what's happened to the heat pump pretty quickly. A little bit of background. Uh, I'm a self-proclaimed geothermal junkie. You've been at this for many years, and I enjoy the opportunity to talk about geothermal and rise up to the standard for whatever problem is occurring. A little bit of history about Bosch. As you know, Bosch is diversified in many aspects, fire tools, appliances, the off-pitch roll in your cars, brakes, windshield wipers, spark plugs, you name that. All that has a high quality assumption built into it. And our heat pumps hold no second candle to that either. Our, our heat pumps are top notch, they're a good quality product, and they have to be to hold up to Bosch's reputation. As Elena mentioned, we are built in Fort Lauderdale, so it's one of the few products that are actually built in the United States. Over 548 different locations, which has grown now substantially. It does all the different facets of what Bosch has to offer. History about Geo. Ford heat pump started back in 1970, which Bosch purchased in 2007. Most of the stuff started in garages, mom pop shops ideas, brainstorming of what we do, how can we build this mousetrap better. And uh, in 2007, Bosch acquired FHP. They didn't make a lot of changes in the beginning, but they did bring on those changes toward the end. Uh, during our comparison to our dishwasher today for sound attenuation and quietness and efficiencies. And you're gonna see some of that renovations in our heat pumps as we continue on. This is just a picture inside the lab down at the shop in Fort Lauderdale. These are water to water units being fabricated. There's no robotic computer based processes. These are all hand skilled technicians, brazing and testing, wiring, piping, refrigerant. Human error sometimes can occur. Uh, we are human. But overall, they have a pretty good reputation to being on time and on target. And that's what we're going to focus with today. How do we troubleshoot something that may not be up to standards? From our Team, our bullpen, or our team of relief. We got ourselves the engine right, commercial installed person that helps on commissioning of installations. Jorge Cerez, George, he's been there forever. So if you have an older system that's FHP and having issues on trying to find parts or information, George is your go to. Omar and Alfredo, man the phones. When you call in them, they're going to need the model serial number. The early days of FHP. We're kind of a custom build shop. If you don't have the original build spec, it's hard to get parts or place, replacement parts for it. So we must have the model and serial number. We're also gonna ask for heat of extraction, heat of rejection. Heat of extraction, heat of rejection will prove it's a problem within the heat pump or it's a problem within the application. And that's really what we're gonna focus on today is how to get the heat of extraction, heat of rejection. How to determine in your own eyes and mind what is going on with this unit. So that being said, we have a couple sections we're gonna attack. We're gonna attack the water side, we're gonna attack the electrical side, and then the air side. Those three things need to be up to standards before you can really get into doing heat of extraction, heat of rejection. If one of those three areas are coming up a bit weak, then it's gonna affect the outcome of heat of extraction, heat of rejection. In this picture right here, you see on the left-hand side, there are six loops. This is considered a reverse return. A reverse return means the first loop out is the last loop back into the structure. The last loop out is the first loop back into the structure. That's what keeps the loops the same length. In a six-ton heat pump, our flow rate leaving that building is at 18 gallon per minute. Three gallon per ton for a closed loop system. If those loops out in the field are not identical to friction loss, the ones that would be shorter are going to get more flow. The ones that are longer are going to have less flow. That is considered a vertical slinky in which there are loops up. Every one of them loops that are positioned up at the top can become an air trap. They become cumbersome to purge. Cumbersome if you're not careful when you're doing your diagnostics. You can induce air into the loop field and then require a flush and purge cart to get them out. This is a typical installation of a pressurized loop field. No valves, no manifold inside the structure, just two pipes leaving the home, and that one pipe is going out, one pipe's coming back in, and you're moving 18 gallons of water 
out to that field. There's no way to balance or to verify. In a non-pressurized system, you would have 12 pipes coming back in the building. I'm big into non-pressurized. It's easy to diagnostic. We don't need a flush and purge cart. We can flush and purge right from the flow center. In my own home, I have nine ton of heat pump. We have old command air equipment from 2003. We have in-floor reading heat in the basement with an overpour and then a air handler in the attic. And we have the lines going up to the attic or hydronic lines big in the attic air handler. Returns are high. I'm sorry, returns are low in the floor. Supplies are high. And then we have a remote unit located in the garage. So we're looking about $700 a year is my total heating, cooling, domestic water heating cost with the heat pumps. And this is nine ton of water to water. They've been fantastic. Understanding the technology and how it goes, how it works, it's not complicated. It's extremely easy stuff. The picture on the right hand side of that is Doc Bose from International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. These guys are relics in their time at this point. Take a look at the soils there. It looks like we're digging up coffee grounds. It's so easy and clean and pure. Back in my home turf, we've got rocks and boulders and tree stumps and roots and what have you. Rare do you find soil like that. And that's a ditch which is actually doing the, the digging in the background. So our loops must be within 5% length of each other. If I have a 400 foot unicoil, that's 20 foot of difference. That's 5%. 20 foot is 10 foot per tail. 10 foot down, 10 foot back. So when your well driller is drilling the wells, we got to make sure those wells are all about the same length or we consume the tails in our trench entering into the building. So when it comes up to flow rates, there's a couple things you need to know on diagnostics. The first one is closed loop flow rates are always built around three gallon per minute per ton. Even if we get into the boiler tire applications, three gallon per minute per ton. Open loop is 1.5 gallon per minute per ton, two, three. It depends on the temperatures. So naturally, when we have a lower flow rate, my delta T grows. When I have a higher uh, flow rate, my delta T shrinks. So what we normally see on a heat pump operating in the heat mode closed loop is a five degree delta T from water in, water out of the heat pump. On an open loop system, you can see as much as 10 degrees. An AC closed loop will be 10 degrees. An open loop can be as high as 20 degrees. Significant differences in water temperatures, performance values and concerns. So in the heating mode, if I have my open loop system coming in with 50 degree water, water temperature leaving that heat pump will be 40 degrees. The 40 degree water leaving the heat pump, that puts my evaporator coil at 30 degrees inside the system. At 30 degrees, we can start to form layers of ice inside the heat pump. That's why we cannot go below 50 degree on an open loop system at one and a half gallon per minute. However, if I get from 50 to 45 degrees, Go all the way down to 45, which is the bare bones, can't go any lower on an open loop system. At 45, if I increase my flow rate 3 GPM from 1.5 to 3, my delta T is only 5 degrees, not 10. That puts me at 45 entering, 40 leaving, and we're still at a 30 degree evaporator coil. That's why we claim the sizes or the flow rates on open loop systems are very dependent upon the incoming water. And if our incoming water is going to go below 45 degrees, open loop is not an option. We have a chance of freezing up that system. So why the lower flow rates on open loop system? Because there's pumping costs involved. Electricity to run the well pumps. The commodity of water. The commodity of water is not everlasting. In some cases, it's very concerning. Water quality. If I look at an open loop system, and I just give you these quick numbers for perspective, if we're moving a six ton heat pump at 1.5 gallon per minute, that is nine gallon per minute flow rate. If we're on a design day, which means we're gonna run pretty much all day long. If I take nine gallon per minute times 60 minutes per hour, that's 540 gallon of water per hour that I'm consuming. If I take that times 24 hours, that is 12,000 
800 gallons of water per day that my six ton heat pump would consume. That's our drinking water. Where do you put 12,800 gallons of water? So I put it into my septic system. Uh, septic systems are designed for four to 600 gallons of flow per day. You put 12,000, we're gonna have a lot of stuff floating in the yard. The reality is sometimes it's very hard. A lot of states, they require reinjection wells. So that water must go back in the same aquifer it came from. If you don't, you can have a imbalance. And if you're close to the shore, you can have brine water replacing your drinking water. So an open loop system, in my opinion, not that of Bosch, Bosch really doesn't care whether you do closed loop or open loop. An open loop system is not a matter of if it's gonna fail, it's when. Water qualities, conditions, concerns, stability, total dissolved solids, all that stuff comes into play. So when working with heat pumps, water source heat pumps, flow rate is critical. A good analogy I can give to you is in our boiler world, we know that we can get out of a three quarter pipe, 80,000 BTUs of heat. We can take 180 degree water, come in and take a 40 degree drop, come out with 140 and deliver 80,000 BTUs. With geothermal, for me to deliver 80,000 BTUs, it's gonna require 18 gallon per minute flow rate. That's not a three quarter pipe. That's an inch and a half pipe. And that is one of the most common errors found in installing a geo is undersizing our pipes. Not having a concept on the flow rate that is required. In my world of water to water, we have to have the same pipe on the source side as load side. A lot of times people will go in with maybe inch and a half on the source side and then put three quarter pecs on the load side. Three quarter pecs is only five eighths ID. We cannot get the flow rate. Any unit suffers. So understanding flows, understanding what's happening is important. How do we do that? We got a couple of ways. We can use a pressure gauge, a digital pressure gauge, a DeWire, DP, GW8. It gives you a lot of information pertaining to bars, KPA, feet of head, inches of water column, pressure drop. If it did temperature, it'd be ideal. It does not do temperature. We have to have antifreeze in our system. That's what the, the spectrometer is on the left-hand side there, the hydrometer. Measuring specific gravity of that solution. Water, water propylene glycol, water methanol, water ethanol glycol, propylene, ethyl methanol, ethanol alcohol. All those are options for antifreezes. The reality is the antifreeze is in there to protect the coaxial heat exchanger, or brace plate, if we have brace plate heat exchangers in my heat pumps. It does not take a lot to freeze them, but once that happens, especially with brace plate, the unit is pretty much garbage at that point. Water and refrigerant will intermix and the unit's junk. We gotta verify that process. This is our heat pump. Take note that our bottoms are always the inlets, our tops are the outlets. If I came up on a service call and I was checking out this unit and my pressure in, was 35, my pressure out was 40. How could you have more pressure out of a heat pump than in? Flow is backwards. When I have flow backwards, there's a performance deficit gonna occur with that unit by as much as 25%. The easiest way that you can verify this or understand it is with a hydronic coil. My hottest water is on the air leaving side. My coolest water or leaving water is on the air entering side. So as the air goes through that coil, it progressively gets hotter until it meets the hottest water with the warmest air as it leaves the coil. If I were to pipe that backwards and have the hottest water on the air entering side and the coolest water on the air leaving side, as the air and water progress through the coil, they both cool down and we lose by as much as 25% capacity. Ins are ins, outs are outs. Even though this is only a 13 foot coaxial coil, flow rates are critical. Direction of flow is critical. Our pressure in should always be higher. Our pressure out is less. That is a two pipe coaxial coil. We have a pipe within a pipe. 
The inner pipe is rifled. That's where water passes through. That can be copper or cooper nickel, depending on the chemicals, depending on what water we're using, the open loop, closed loop, boiler tire. The outer jacket between the copper and the steel is refrigerant. We know from the oil furnace games that one sixteenth inch of soot is equivalent to three inches of insulation in R11. A little bit of calcium or lime buildup, dirt, and mud inside that heat exchanger will act much like that one sixteenth inch of soot and insulate the transfer capability between our refrigerant and our water. And sometimes we may have a good flow rate, but we have very low delta T. The temperature difference from water in and water out with a good flow rate could be a low charge. It could be at the end going out and head pressure or free stab, dirty conditions. Your open loop systems are always subjective to that contamination. So we'd use what we call PP ports, pressure temperature ports, Pete's plugs. And what this is is much like a basketball football needle in which you put your needle in this port, this neoprene opens. You can actually go into the water jacket and sense water pressure or water temperature. When you remove your needle, that port closes and seals itself off. It is the most accurate way to go. So we can do our flow rates either through the PT ports or what the blue and white flow tool is above, in which case I don't need the manufacturer's cut sheet to know what the pressure drop equals. I can see the flow rate. I can see the micro bubbles in the system if there will be a problem with infiltrating there. It is by far the most accurate way to that heat exchanger. And at antifreeze, we talked about at the beginning, whether we're in Florida or we're in PA or up in Maine, that antifreeze is in there to protect the coil. In the heating season or air conditioning season, in water to water applications, one coax always has the opportunity to freeze. Even in the summertime, if my pump would airlock or if I lose my pump, I could actually freeze the load side heat exchanger and crack it. So we're always going to use, hopefully, the MPPT ports, which are quarter inch or half inch pipe thread. You can do that in PVC if you're going to non pressurized flow centers. We do not want steel, black iron, malleable pipe on our system anywhere. Stainless steel. PE, PVC, CPVC, brass, copper are all acceptable. Still black iron or not. So with the water side measurements, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of parameters. First is going to be the temperature. We have our thermometers on top. We have an analog thermometer and a digital thermometer. We're in the 21st century. We should be using digital thermometers at this point. Digital thermometers are a little more precise, a little more accurate. Analogs are open to your interpolation. Infrared thermometers are not recommended. Infrared requires an emissivity setting every time you use that thermometer. The emissivity setting requires you to shoot your item that you want to know what the temperature is with black masking tape. And you shoot it a second time without the black masking tape in place. You're going to take the lower number divided by the upper number, and that will give you a percentage, which is called the emissivity. And then if you're Infrared thermometer has that emissivity setting on it. You set the thermometer to match up your reading, and now that thermometer is accurate to read temperature. If you want to go in and just check a breaker box for a hot breaker, it's fine for what it is. Cool, 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 hot. Cool. The clamp on thermometers can be accurate. It's not going to give you precise temperature. It might be off by as much as five degrees. However, if you're checking the water in and water out, we want to know what the temperature difference is. As long as the pipe consistency is the same, copper on copper, brass on brass, not PVC on brass or PVC and steel, there'll be a definite insole value difference. But if it's on the same materials, then you could use a clamp on in a desperate situation. And once again, with digital pressure gauges, you're going to find out later on if that's really crucial to be accurate. We're down in tents of a PSI to confirm that we have the proper flow rate. Analog is open to interpolation. If I said to you on the analog gauge, I need 1.3 PSI or 5.2 PSI, you're not gonna get close. Proper tools, proper job. This is part of our engineering submittal sheet. This is on an SM036. 
you see there's some temperatures there. We have a 30, 40, 50. That'd be incoming water. Next one is water flow, GPM, then pressure drop. Those are the ones we're going to focus on now. We'll look at the rest of the chart a little later. The first thing is a pressure drop. That pressure drop gives you two numbers. It gives you feet of head and PSI. The PSI is the ones that are not in the brackets. 1.5, 2.5, 5.2. Thirty degree scale. The bracketed is the feet of head. It takes that PSI times two point three one and actually calculates feet of head. Feet of head is the resistance to flow, the amount of work that a pump must overcome to move that volume of water through that heat heat exchanger, coaxial heat exchanger. So in other words, if I have my SM036 and I'm physically moving nine gallon of water per minute through that heat exchanger, my foot ahead would be 12 foot ahead. My pressure drop on the gauge should be showing me 5.2 PSI. So 5.2, you correlate that over to flow rate, that'd be your nine. And then the temperature is 30 degrees. If you take note, our 30, 40, and 50 have three temperature slots or three pressure slots in each one. We have a low, a medium, and a high. The low is our minimum open loop. In other words, if I'm doing open loop, I've got to have at least 1.4 PSI through the heat exchanger for this three ton. All these sizes are different. They are not universal. I cannot say this is the same on a six ton heat pump as a 10 ton or a 30 ton. Every pressure drop will be different with every heat pump. But this is what would be for an SMO36 at 40 degrees. The next number is my minimum closed loop. If I'm doing closed loop, I gotta be at least six gallon per minute. If I'm not, the system is at jeopardy. The system is not performing as it should, and life cycle will be a lot shorter than what it should be. Our design is in mind. Three gallon per minute per ton. A lot of times people come back to the idea, well, three is good, four has got to be better. Five is best. Let's go six gallon per minute per ton. When you increase your gallon per minute per ton, you increase your electrical pump energy consumption. You increase the electricity being consumed. You have more of a chance of eroding the heat exchanger away. Copper, flow rate, eight foot per second. Cooper nickel, flow rates, 12 foot per second velocity. If you exceed those velocity numbers, you will actually erode the heat exchanger away. Water is corrosive or erosive? Absolutely. Look at Niagara Falls. Look at any waterfall. Water can be very erosive. That's the water side. We're not going to look at the electrical side. And guys and gals, when we're looking at the electrical side, you got one interesting piece in the middle there. That's that contact. That contactor is going to give you an opportunity to look into the side of this heat pump and give you a condition of how well it's performing. Is it struggling? Is it stressed? When I pull the cover off that contactor and look at the points, the points in that contactor are going to give you a pretty good insight to how is the health of that unit. If those points are turning red and discolored, that means that there's high amp draw. Points burn when they make or break. Correct, it's when they break, not on a make. So there's high current being drawn across those points. We depower that contactor, that points will draw an arc across them, the current will try to jump the point, and that's what eats away the points. Contactors are designed to live within their realms of what they're rated for, 30 amp, 40 amp. As long as we're below those numbers, the points will not arc, they will not burn, they will not erode away. But if my amperage is above or close to the max design, I will eat away that contactor. When my amperage is high and I'm operating a water to air heat pump in the heat mode, is that amperage high for the compressor head pressure because of water flow? or airflow. All geothermal heat pumps are assumed it's a water flow and that's not the correct answer. The correct answer is airflow. If I'm in AC mode and the head pressure is running high, is that the water side or air side is causing the high amperage, the high head pressure? In that case, that would be water side. If we're in a water to water heat pump, some people try to make it a boiler. They want 140 degree water, leaving our water to water. You burn up contactors. 
you run up compressors, and these will be garbage. Maximum water temperature of a water to water leaving heat pump would be 120, and that is extreme. 115 is where we target. By reading the contactor, you can determine what's happening in the system. Voltage must be within 10%. 240 volts, that gives you 24 volt lead width. Up to 264 down to 216. If I'm below 216, that's a utility call to call the utility company and say, hey guys, you got a problem. Or heat pumps work below 216, they may for a while, but the amperage is going to be high, the heat's going to be high, and it's going to kill that compressor. Same above the upper side. There's a sweet spot, we'll call it, and that is the normal of 10%. We don't want to be that high, but the utility will give itself 10%. So if you're running 240 or you're supposed to be and you're pulling 230, call the utility, they're going to say, thank you for letting me know. They, they really aren't going to be concerned about that. Our transformers have two taps in the system. We have a 208, 240 volt tap. A 2 a 240 volt can be taken as a 10 to 1 ratio. So if I have 240 volt in, I got 24 volt out. If I have a 240 volt tap and only have 208 volt applied, I have 208 in, I get 220.8 out, 21 volt out. My system's already running a low voltage. Without having a multi-tap transformer, when I tap it for 208, I go back up to the 240 that I should, or the 24 volt that I should see. So understanding that a two tap should reflect the incoming voltage, that transformer is nothing more than a 10 to one ratio step down or step up in some cases of what the primary current is. So as my primary voltage drops, my secondary voltage drops. On three phase, and it's not found on residential, but in commercial that it is, on three phase rotation, if you ever hear a scroll compressor run backwards, they're pretty noisy. If you see a fan running backwards, it's obvious the scroll cage should blow in the direction of the curved blades. If it's going backwards, that more like an exhaust fan. Typically, you just change the wires at the disconnect. You do not want to go in and change a fan motor running backwards because the compressor and the other motors will probably run backwards. Always do it at the disconnect. Your voltages should be within two volts. So if I have a three-phase power coming in, a to B is 240, B to C is 240, A to C is 230. Not acceptable. That's a utility call. That compressor is running on. Always should check voltage under load and record it. That is your baseline. Your baseline is when you install a piece of equipment. It is the best it can ever be. That's important to have a baseline for comparing. And it should be done under load. Next is our air side. We got to verify that we have proper airflow. And the easiest way to do that is with electric heat. A lot of times electric heat is the choice for supplemental heat, not necessarily backup. Geothermal does not need backup heat. Air and air heat pumps need backup heat. Geothermal just needs supplemental heat. We'll go through a process to calculate the airflow based off that supplemental heat. So to do this, we've got to have the heat pump in the emergency heat rate only. In other words, the emergency heat is going to shut off the compressor. We do not want any heat coming from the refrigeration cycle to verify our CFM delivery. So we're going to shut the compressor down. Heat pump's going to run. We're going to calculate the amount of power being consumed. We're going to measure the volts, measure the amps. Volts times the amps equal what? That's correct. Volts times amps equal watts. How many BTUs are in what? 3.413. That's always going to be there. Whether I'm running electric water element, electric water heater with elements, same BTUs. At 4,500 watt puts out 15,000 BTUs of energy, roughly. So we know what that's going to be. That's always going to be there. Our formula is this volts times amps or watts times 3.413 divided by the temperature rise across that furnace, that air handler, that coil, times 1.08. 1.08 is the specific heat in one pound of air. It is a constant. It's always calculated. When you're doing these measurements, you want to be aware of where we take the measurements. One is at the return air at the unit, not at the register. 
not somewhere that's going to be 50 feet away from the air handler in a crawl space in the basement. Air at the register is 70 degrees. Air at the heat pump is 50 degrees. Your heat pump's not going to look too promising if you base it off the 70, not off the 50 that it's actually seen. Our supply has got to be out of the sight of the elements. If I put my thermometer in that spot right now where it shows the supply, item number two right in this area right here, I will have a bogus reading. The bogus reading will be because the infrared coming off the elements will affect the thermometer. My reading needs to be out of the sight of those elements. It has to be up here over 90 degrees away from the side of my elements. When you're doing this, guys, this is live voltage. This is always a point in time we talk about safety when it comes to live voltage. You should only measure voltage with one hand. There's a story that came out of Canada about a gentleman who apparently was out servicing a heat pump and the ground wire from the resilient motor to the housing was not connected. He touched the motor, he touched the housing, he's no longer with us today. The 50 millivolt, the 50 milliamp, milli, miscule amount of voltage and amperage across the heart's enough to stop it. If you go in with two hands, good chance that voltage is going to cross right, right across the heart. If you go with one hand, if there's a problem, it goes out the leg, it doesn't cross the heart. Two hands, it crosses the heart. Do your diligence. Don't become a statistic. This is live voltage that we're dealing with. It has a pretty good punch. In this formula, we're going to take a quick look. Our 240 volt was what we measured under load. We measured 20 amp under load. That 20 amp includes the blower motor because the blower motor is in the airstream and includes the electric elements that are in the airstream and includes a transformer that is in the heat pump as well. We see my return air at the unit is 70 degrees. My supply air at the unit away from the elements is 88. That'd be an 18 degree rise. So we take our 240 times 20, that gives me my watts times 3.413 and divided by our delta T of 18 times 1.08. My answer comes out to be 842 CFM. So this is an accurate way. This is a true way. This is a realistic way of getting CFM. This takes into account all of the cardboard returns, registers and grills are opened or closed, condition of squirrel cage blower mode, wheels, condition of the coils, are they dirty, are they plugged? You do your due diligence, you go there, you find this application on a test, you clean the blower motor, you clean the wheels, you clean the coil, you open up four or five duct registers up in the second floor that were closed. My delta T now goes from 88 to 70, and it drops it down to 79 and 70. That's a nine degree rise, not 18. If I have a nine degree rise and everything else is the same, I'm now at 1684 CFM. That, that BTUs is always there. The delta T is going to tell you, based on airflow, what's happening to the system. Very easy, very precise, no pitot tubes, no traverses, no special instrumentation. Basically, a thermometer, a voltmeter, or a volt amp meter. Prior to run this compressor, we've got to make sure the voltage is correct, which we have. It has to, if it has a crank case heater, we don't have one in our systems, but the Paradigm would, Intertech has units that sits outside of the compressor, would have a crank case heater. Remember, a crank case heater prevents refrigerant migration, keeps the compressor so there's no liquid sitting in the compressor on startup. It's all vapor. The compressor is meant to pump vapor, not liquid. We got to verify our water flow rate is proper. How do we do that? A flow tool, pressure gauge. Airflow rate sufficient. How do we do that? Electric heat. Our thermostat needs to be programmed for what we're using. Three heat, two coal is the most common on a geo. On a package unit, not so critical that you run an AC first, but a split system always run AC first. Why? It puts the filter jar in front of the TXV. Hopefully, to pick up the garbage that might be in the system. Be sure antifreeze is present, especially 
on water to water source and load side, not just the source side. All it takes is one little glitch that you're not on your game. You create a block of ice in the heat exchanger and you crack it, it's junk. The startup sheet's an awesome way to verify what's going on. Here's a copy of the startup sheet. This is in the IOM, Installation Operation Manual. This operation sheet will give you the date, the name. It's going to give you a lot of information, the charge, motor amperages, what you measured, what was the incoming voltage at, what was my entering and leaving air temperatures. Even comes down here and asking you about suction pressure and head pressure. On a split system, you got gauges hooked up. Take it. Get the information. On a package unit, we do not want you to hook up gauges. Every time you hook up and disconnect on a package unit, you're going to blow out six ounces of refrigerant. Three times we're over a pound of refrigerant, we're down. Do not hook up gauges. Everything we're talking about up to this point has been non invasive and we're going to continue non invasive. We do not want to hook in the refrigeration system if we can help it. We have our electric heat at the bottom. We can take our measurements for electric heat and then keep this record on file. This is your baseline. Sometimes the baseline will pick up minor issues. I'm not getting the proper delta T across that heat exchanger. I don't have the proper flow rate. This is a six ton heat pump. I should have 18 gallon. I've got 12. If you don't do the start up and test it in the beginning, you may never pick up that this unit was underrated on flow rate from day one. Will it operate? Sure it'll operate. Will it operate normal? Probably not. What are you going to see signs and symptoms? Point, burnt points on contacts. Excessive head pressure, especially in the summertime mode under the water side. Major concerns that could have been detected just by doing the startup sheet. So we're not ready to get to our heat of extraction, heat of rejection. As a reminder, all those other steps have to be done. If we don't check GPM, CFM, electrical, then our measurements will be inaccurate. We will not get a true HEHR. Sometimes you'll go to repairs that didn't need to be done. You cost the customer, you cost the company, you cost yourself time, dollars, efforts. Always practice the six Ps. What's the six Ps? Pre-planning prevents piss poor performance. Practice the six Ps. Become a perfectionist. Here is the heat of extraction, heat of rejection formula. For those boiler people out there, this is a boiler formula. This is not a heat pump. This is not a Bosch. This is a boiler formula. BTUH is equal to GPM times delta T times brine. Brine in this case is 500. That's what the boiler people use. Understanding that BTUs per hour, gallon per minute, is a two different time slot. We cannot do that. It must equal the same. What do we do? We take one pound of water. One pound of water weighs what? One pound. One gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds. If I take 8.33 times 60 gallons per minute, minutes per hour, it comes out to be 499.96. We'll call it 500. If I take antifreeze, methanol, ethanol, the specific gravity is less than one. As a result, the weight of one gallon of methanol or ethanol is 8.08 .08 pound per gallon. The weight of propylene glycol would be over 8.33 pound. So if you're using propylene, you really should be using the 500 brine number, methanol, ethanol, the 485. My HRP, the superior, needs to be off. That's pretty complicated on Bosch systems. There's a switch, turn it off. Second stage needs to be activated. How do you verify second stage is activated? Jump across Y1 to Y2. If Y1 and Y2 are now wired together and it's running, then second stage has to be energized. At least allow the unit to operate for five minutes to stabilize before you take your reading. And the most common mistake that can be made is not using the same gauge, the same thermometer. That's critical. We'll see that in just a little bit. As a refresher, five minutes of time, water temperature, same thermometer, same pressure gauge. Make sure it has antifreeze. Make sure it's in second stage and the HRP is off. 
We're going back to my heat of extraction chart as an earlier, the SMO36. My formula pops up the top of the screen. BTUH is equal to delta T, GPM, and brine. Brine can be described as 545. Is it water or is it alcohol? My incoming parameters in this application, entering water is 30 degrees, leaving water is 25. Mending water pressure is 40 PSI, leaving water pressure 34.8. My entering air temp is at 70 degrees. We're now going to start. That's all the information that I need to determine is this heat pump accurate or not? Is it an application issue or is it a heat pump issue? A thermometer, a pressure gauge in this chart. So here we go. We got ourselves 30 degrees, so that's going to be the slot we're going to use. We got ourselves a 5.2 psi, 40 subtract 34.8 is 5.2 psi. Equivalent would be 12 point ahead is what would be measured across that key exchanger if I'm getting the proper flow rate. We're using 70 degree as my entering water temp. If I go across the chart, I find that 5.2 of Pressure drop equals nine gallon per minute. Well, holy heck, we got our formula calculated up there. Here we go. Our delta T was five degrees. Our flow rate's at nine GPM. Our brine is 485. We multiply it out and it comes out to be 21,825 BTUs. That is heat of extraction. That is heat of absorption. That is free heat. That is the solar gain. That is happening every day that the sun is shining and it's replacing that energy in the ground. Constant re, resaturation of the earth. You see, my chart says under HA, heat of extraction, heat of absorption. It's the same animal, it's the same beast. It says we should be 21,100. We've got 21,800. We're definitely within our 10% number, 15 max. At that point, this heat pump's fine. It does not have a problem. If we can't keep up, if the bills are high, Customer's not happy, it's more of an application issue. It's not a heat pump performing issue. Now, if we stop right there, and this is where we're sometimes we get ourselves in trouble, look to the column next to it, it says we have 29,100 as our total BTUs. Our heat absorption is 21,000. Where do the other 8,000 BTUs come from? Holy heck, we must have a leak in the system. Get a jug of 410, we're gonna have to add more charge. We apparently have a leak in the system. Not the case. We look to our KW. Our KW is written right there. That is electrical energy that's being brought in. The heat pump has to consume to make this energy, to harvest this energy. That 2.44 is going to be the BTU, or I'm sorry, KW, it's going to be converted to BTUs. So we got to convert. What is that number? 11 equals 3.412. A KW would be 3,412. We take our 2.4 times 3412, it's 8,188 BTUs. We now add the heat of absorption plus the KW in BTUs. There's my 30,000 BTUs total capacity. It calls for 29.1. Sounds like we're on the money. We're getting our heat. Take note that we're buying 8,000 BTUs. I'm getting 30,000. That's almost a four COP. If I had a four COP coefficient of performance, I was heating this building for $10,000 a year. I put the heat pump in and now it cost me $2,500 a year. I just put $7,500 in your pocket. 10 years of 75,000, 20 years, 150,000. What can you invest in today and get that kind of rate of return in 20 years? That is legal. Got to be legal. Let's calculate COP. Pretty simple number. Total cooling capacity, 30,000, divided by the 8,000 in KW comes out to be 3.6 COP. That's all the information on that chart. Look like a bunch of garbage and moobla goobla numbers, but understand a couple of things you can verify quickly. And we didn't do that with refrigeration gauges. We didn't even do it with a volt amp meter. All we really did was a pressure gauge a flow tool in the thermometer. And the heat of rejection, same same formula, same brine factor because we can't change between wintertime and summertime. There's my new parameters. 
80 degree water leaving, 70 in. Anytime water leaving is warmer than water coming in, we're in the AC mode. Anytime the water is leaving is cooler than the water coming in, we're in the heat mode. Pressure again is 40 pounds in, 35.5 out, 75 degree under an air temp. We now go to our chart. So we're at 70 degree water coming in, 4.5 is my PSI. We're down at 10.38. Why the drop? Water temperature is warmer. Warmer water, easier to pump, less resistance to flow. As a result, head is going to be lower. 75 degrees, we got 9 GPM. We take our 9 GPM times 10.5 times 45. We got 45,833 BTUs. My absorption is 21. My rejection is 45. That's a three ton heat pump, but not almost four ton of capacity. If I have a swimming pool and I want to heat my swimming pool from air conditioning to my home, incorporate a brace plate heat exchanger between the pool water and the heat pump. I don't have to add any additional pumps. I do have a brace plate, I got some piping, maybe a relay. I can actually heat my pool all summer long as I air condition my house. And I'm getting an extra ton worth of capacity. Take a look at our charts, 46,000, worth in about 100 and some BTUs. Definitely within 10 or 15%, life is good. Awesome. We take a look at my KW consumption, 1.96, all that goes back like before. This now needs to be deducted from my total heat of rejection. That electric energy that we're consuming, the pump, the compressor, the fan, is putting heat in the air, but we're trying to pull heat out of the air. Well, I can't include what's adding heat. So that heat that's coming in has got to be deducted from my total capacity. What is left is what I can now actually do chilling in my house with. That gives me a net of 39,145 BTUs. Take a look at the chart, 39.7, we're within our tolerances, life is good. Now to come up with the ER, we take that total cooling and divide it by the KW. This time we do not convert it to BTUs. EER does not convert BTUs from KW. In this case, we got a 19.9 EER, 20.2 is a book, we're in tolerances. Something else I can calculate off this chart. This is going to be a snapshot and picture, dry bulb, wet bulb. I've got 39,000 total cooling. I've got 29 is what my sensible cooling capacity is. I take that from the two, it comes out to be 9,745 is latent. Latent is the amount of energy in the work and the air that's moisture. It is the humidity factor, of what we got to overcome to make it comfort. Sensible cooling is that of what I can sense, what I can measure, what I can feel. Latent. It's the stickiness, the uncomfortableness, the closeness in the airstream. If we do the heat of extraction, heat of rejection, and we're within our 10 to 15 percent, then go home and have a beer. It's all over. You figured out the problem. If you're not, that may be another issue. Always use digital. If you're using digital, you should be closer to the 10 percent. If you're using analog, we'll drift up to 15. A non evasive way. No gauges, no voltmeters. Where's this information found? In the IOM and the ESS. Where's that information found? At www.bosch-climate-us-products. If you go on to the easiest one I can remember is boschheatingandcooling.com. You can find yourself around where you need to go once you go to that website, boschheatingandcooling.com. What else can be found in the IOMs? CFM settings, wiring, piping, condensate, performance, startup and checkout sheet. All that stuff is critical. You need to know where it is, what it's at. We have a chart in the back that gives you pressures. It gives you suction and discharge, water rises, air temperature rises. That chart, if it's a split, you got to hook up gauges anyways, go for it. If it's not a split, do not hook up gauges. I can take the information at 50 degree in water temperature, knowing I've got nine gallons in the flow rate, I should see an eight to 10 degree rise in cooling. I should see a 19 to 24 degree drop on the air side. Or if I'm in heating, I can see what the pressure temperature rise and drop will be. Beneficial, more diagnostics. 
In summarizing up, heat of extraction deals with winter, pulling heat out of the ground. Heat of rejection in the summertime, pushing heat in the ground. Always run the unit in both directions. On our package TX, our package heat pumps, we have a TXV that is bi-direction. One TXV controls flow in both directions. Our split has two TXVs by flow. One direction is free flow and the other way is controlling. If you get them put in backwards, ends always face each other. Ends always face each other on installing TXVs. You can't make that backwards connection in. Complaints, if HE and HR are intolerances, in other words, you've got a good operating unit, but I have still high bill complaint, uncomfort, heat pump doesn't shut off. Could be insulation, infiltration, undersized equipment, poor design. Three areas that come up most common are basements that we want to heat. We don't really want to heat them. We want to keep them from freezing. Give me four runs into a basement that's normally 40 degrees uninsulated. Realizing that basements uninsulated are going to be up around 40 BTUs per square foot of loss. You give me an R5, one inch high density urethane foam on the walls, we'll get it down to less than 10 BTUs per square foot. Fireplaces, we can take a 10 inch round if we all agree on a 10 inch round chimney. That'd be 400 CFM of airflow up the chimney. Zero degree day outside, 70 degrees inside, 20,000 BTUs per hour. Times 1.1, we're 31,000 BTUs per hour if he's going up that chimney. Oh, come on now, I got a damper. I shut my damper. Are those dampers airtight? Are they allowed to be airtight? The answer is no. If you have a fireplace, your best bet is to put a glass door and seal off any in air coming in from the living space, fresh air intake. You want to do something for that customer, block off the flue of that fireplace, block it off with a balloon bag, and just go away for two days, come back. They'll think you're a miracle worker. Holy heck, the house never felt so warm. Why? You just eliminated 400 CFM of zero degree air being pulled in around door switches, Doors, light switches, cracks, windows, what have you. The last one are to pull down attic stairwells. What is the R value for quarter inch Lawan wood? It's not a weather stripped or sealed. I have 30,000 each one of those places 30,000 out of the basement, 30,000 fireplace, 30,000 in the attic. I'm now short 90,000 BTUs. Why is my heat pump not keeping up? Complaints about. You know what? The heat pump gets the house temperature. Two minutes later, it's running again. What a piece of poop. That's not a heat pump issue. Probably not a thermostat issue. It is an infiltration issue. Sometimes it requires reverse engineering. I've already got this size heat pump in my home. I need to make it work. We're going to take the runs out of the basement. We're going to block off the fireplace. We're going to put an insulated blanket on my pull-down attic. Huge differences can be seen by minor performances. When you go through the HE and HR, if they're not in tolerance, we're not within our 10 or 15%. And just to give you a quick example, if we go back to our 21,000 BTUs of heat extraction on a three ton heat pump with a five degree delta T, if I go to a four degree delta T, the heat of extraction is down to 17,000. From a five to a four degree, one degree delta T difference. I'm going from perfect to now the unit is in need of repair. Accuracy is really critical. We got to have the same thermometer. We got to have enough time in that duct or in that water jacket to stabilize so the water's not changing. You just can't go in, pull it out, put it in, pull it out, and say, we're done. You got to stabilize. You got to be accurate. If it doesn't work, do it a second time. If the results are still not there, then we're going to have to go in the gauges, subcoin, super heat. And again, that's got to be the last result. Other modules that Bosch offers for training on this, these are normally hands on live fire courses, many of them. We hope to get back to that. This is actually done for module six. That's why it's not being shown up there. This is a normal four hour operation that we put it down to 45 minutes. We covered a lot with you today. I do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to participate with us in GEO. And we're going to take some time now to answer questions that you may or may not have. There are no dumb questions. The only dumb questions are the ones that you don't ask. Elaine, open up the mic.